All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our sixth edition BCBA task list series, where we're going through each item on the sixth edition task list and breaking it down. Today, we're continuing with A5, Dimensions of Applied Behavior Analysis. This is a relatively straightforward topic in that each item is not too difficult to understand, but keeping them organized on your exam and distinguishing between them can be challenging. So you want to be very fluent in these dimensions. Not to mention in practice, these should be what guide your interventions, your treatments, your assessments, basically everything you do. There's a reason they are still looked at as so important all these years later. So as always, we're going to break them down into simple terms and things we think you need to know for your exam and in practice. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. So let's start with just an introduction. This is Bear, Wolf, and Grizzly. These are these seven dimensions of applied behavior analysis. And you can see these have been persistent for a very long time. That's how strong and important they are. They're the foundational framework for implementing behavior analytic interventions. Why do we use these dimensions? Well, we're trying to ensure we're being effective, which is a dimension. We also want to be ethical, and we want to align with the goals of our science. Many, many years of practice has led us to where we are today as far as the science of our field goes and how we should be treating clients and designing interventions. These dimensions make sure we're adhering and respecting all the hard work that's come before us. So the dimensions need to guide how you assess your clients and formulate your treatment plans. So let's start with applied. And when we think about applied behavior analysis, those are three of our dimensions. And the first one is applied. Think about our, one of our previous videos where we talked about experimental analysis of behavior, where experimentation was done in a very tightly controlled lab. And then when we took applied behavior analysis, now we're focusing on the real world, right? Things that matter. And that is what applied is all about. We're focusing on behaviors that are socially significant to the individual and society. Remember, you're not just in it for the client, you're in it for the client and everybody around that client. So we're trying to make sure our interventions practical and they have importance and address meaningful issues in that person's life. That key word here is meaningful. So behaviors you target for change should be meaningful to the client and those around them. You're going to find many times during assessments, you could work on a hundred different behaviors. It's up to you as the analyst to be applied and decide what's most important because we only have so many hours in the day, so many resources. Be applied. So for example, Teaching communication for basic needs is obviously socially significant, opposed to targeting a behavior that annoys a stakeholder. Being annoying is not necessarily socially significant just by definition, right? Obviously, if it's impeding a learner from society, it's a different story. But teaching communication for basic needs is going to be meaningful, and that's a good applied behavior to target. Next, we have behavioral. Behavioral should be pretty obvious. Behavioral dimension, we're targeting observable and measurable actions. It doesn't mean we don't acknowledge private events. We know they exist, but to change behavior, we want to be able to reliably observe and measure those behaviors. So three specific ideas that Bear, Wolf, and Risley came up with. And the first was the target behavior should be the behavior in need of improvement. Meaning, when you pick a behavior, you're focused on changing that behavior, not other behaviors around it. If you're focused on communication, focus on communication. If you're focused on color identification, focus on color identification. You're being very specific in what we're trying to target. Second, behavior must be measurable. That's not negotiable. If you can't measure it, we can't reliably track it. We can't reliably change it. And then, always ask, whose behavior changed when noticing a change. If you start noticing changes, has the client's behavior changed 
or has the technician's behavior or the parents? Because remember, the environment, the parents and the technicians are responding to the client. So they may be changing their behavior as well. We want to be sure our learner is the one whose behavior is changing. So for example, we're measuring the time it takes for a child to respond to our verbal instruction. Behavioral is exactly what it sounds like. Don't overthink this dimension. Analytic, we want to demonstrate a clear functional relationship. When you think analytic, think functional relationship. This one was always a little challenging for, challenging for me to remember for whatever reason, just think functional relationship when you think analytic. In other words, we want to know that our intervention is causing the behavior change. We're relying on experimental designs and experimentation to demonstrate a level of causation. Why did I say level? Because it's nearly impossible to prove 100% causation. And so we just want to be able to prove with some reasonable doubt that we are causing the change. Our DV and our IV or IV and DV are related. So we're demonstrating a functional relationship between the intervention, which is going to be your IV, and the behavior change, your DV. We want to show that we are controlling the behavior. If we can reliably control the behavior, we can reliably change the behavior. So if you use a reversal design to confirm that reinforcement increases task completion, right? If you have a reversal and you have baseline, and baseline looks like this, and we have intervention and we reverse it, well, we can show that there's likely a functional relationship going on in this design. Technological, I think maybe the easiest dimension, we are emphasizing the importance of detailed procedures that allow replication. When you think technological, think replication. We want to be able to share our successes and our science. So we have to be able to write it and design it in a way that can be replicated. If you write a very complex behavior plan that works, that's great. But if no one else can implement it, that's a problem. This is a team, right? We're all collaborating. It's very team oriented. It also ensures clarity and consistency. It's forcing you to write in a clear, consistent nature. Describe your procedures in detail so they can be replicated accurately. And we can look for much more consistency and fidelity with our technicians and implementers. So for example, a behavior intervention plan specifies step-by-step -step instructions for delivering a token economy system. In other words, if I were to read that behavior plan, I could do it. And if a, let's say, a mildly trained individual read the behavior plan, they could also do it. Technological is all about replication and being able to repeat what you've done. Conceptually systematic. Interventions should be designed using principles of behavior analysis, the reinforcement, punishment, extinction. These are the root of all of our interventions. If you use punishment, you want to try to include some reinforcement as well. We're just trying to make sure that we are still focused on the scientific framework. Well, again, we've had decades and decades of science to support what we're doing. You don't want to stray away from that in favor of something that is not necessarily behavior analytic, or even worse, not empirical. So behavior principles should be the framework for every intervention. You should not use interventions or strategies that are not rooted in behavior analysis if you're working as a behavior analyst. Now, let's say you're a behavior analyst and a speech therapist. If you are working in the capacity as a BCBA, you have to be conceptually systematic. Are you competent to deliver other strategies? You are, but in the context of ABA, you've got to be conceptually systematic. So for example, positive reinforcement to increase on task behavior. That aligns with the principle of reinforcement. This is just preventing us from straying away from our building blocks and foundations. Effective. Intervention should make a meaningful and a significant change in the client's life. What's the difference between applied and effective? Applied is we're choosing the goals. With applied, we're choosing applied goals. Effective, we are actually making that meaningful change. That is the key difference. Meaningful means different things depending on the target behavior and the client situation. If you have a client who is heavily impacted and they go from one to two, that may be a meaningful change. If your client is 
relatively unimpacted and they're maybe just suffer from a few deficits, let's call them. One to two may not be as great as or significant as one to 10. So the meaningful idea is going to be based on needs and situation and your assessment. You want to measure success based on the effectiveness of our intervention, not just any basic behavior change. So we just don't want to say, well, we've changed behavior. We won. Did we effectively change it in a meaningful way? That's what we're looking for. So a reduction in self-injurious behavior that allows the learner to participate with peers is great. But if we're just reducing self-injury at night before bed, when it really doesn't happen that much or doesn't interfere with anything, that may not be considered effective. And then generality, maybe the most important intervention, big picture. All these obviously need to be adhered to. But if we're not generalizing, we're not doing our job. What we teach has to be able to be done in the natural environment. It does no good to teach someone in a, a controlled setting and then they go out in the real world and they can't do it. Nothing's changed. That's not effective. It's not meaningful. It's not good. Generalization needs to be planned for and programmed in, not just hoped for. If your client is not generalizing, then they are not mastering the skill. All right, thanks for watching. Again, seems overwhelming at first. There's there's a lot of them, seems like a lot of information. Once you start breaking them down though, and you start just associating each dimension with some key ideas, it becomes very straightforward. Now, the only thing I would say about the exam is you wanna be very precise and specific because a lot of them can blend together. Think like applied and effective, very similar. You've got to know the difference and be able to spot that difference in the question itself. Additionally, when we think about our assumptions, right, things like determinism and selectionism, don't get those confused with dimensions. Easy concept, but super important and easy to go wrong if you don't put the time and effort into learning it. As always, please subscribe for all of our updates. We're going to be constantly posting this task list series, as well as our practice questions and practice exams. We have RBT materials as well for all those aspiring technicians in your life. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.